Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, the COVID-19. Uh, going to give you an update. Uh, Dr. Arnold originally presented this topic back in February of this year. He did an outstanding job. And um, what I'm going to do is basically uh, tell you up, I'll bring you up to date as to far as as far as what's going on with the uh, COVID-19 itself. Um, so uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, before um, uh, before I before I actually start the slash show, I want to thank everyone that I've had the opportunity and privilege to work with. Uh, I continue also to learn from you all uh, uh, every day and with every interaction we have. Okay. So uh, I don't have anything to disclose. Uh, the objectives today are basically, uh, I'd like for you to know a little bit uh, about the history of COVID-19. Um, we're going to describe the uh, life cycle of the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and events surrounding the cytokine storm. Um, I'd like for you to get an understanding uh, of the clinical presentation and uh, current recommendations for pharmacologic management and uh, I'd like for her to be familiar with some of the vaccines that are in phase three, uh, which are actually uh, in uh, for at least uh, one, maybe two of them are ending and uh, may be available. Um, if I was initially going to start this talk with, uh, with, with the case of Corona, um, but I ran across something like this and thought, uh, you know, it, it could be somewhat confusing. So Instead of having a case, I thought I would better better be suited just keeping things. So real briefly, and again, Dr. Arnold touched on all these things at the very beginning. Um, before uh, 2019, uh, novel coronaviruses resulted in two major outbreaks. Uh, the first in 2002 with SARS, the severe, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and then MERS with the uh, Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome that began in 2012. This, of course, is now the third outbreak of the coronavirus from an animal origin uh, that's causing serious disease in humans. Uh, previously, there were four human endemic coronaviruses, uh, but these have uh, been noted to cause less disease. Uh, this is just a timeline of uh, coronavirus coron coronaviruses. Um, and again, like I said, Dr. Arnold covered most all of these um, uh, in his in his last lecture. Um, and uh, these were just some statistics initially. Uh, with this particular coronavirus, um, on December 31st, uh, uh, a cluster of cases were noted uh, in Wuhan, China. Uh, and by January the 7th, Chinese officials did confirm that a novel coronavirus was associated with this initial cluster. Um, these are actually pictures from the wholesale market in, uh, in the Wuhan, uh, uh, China province, where uh, it is believed that uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19 actually began. Uh, most of the patients that showed up in the initial cluster either worked or visited there. Uh, and there, uh, there are live animals uh, and dead animals being sold for human consumption. And again, quickly, as I said, um, uh, in uh, January of, of, of uh, this year, uh, the scientists uh, in China did uh, find the genome sequence and they posted it publicly uh, to be reviewed. Uh, by January 21st, here in the U.S., we had our first documented case in Washington State. And by January uh, 30th, the WHO did declare an outbreak, uh, a public emergency, but it wasn't until March 11th that the WHO characterized it as an, uh, from an epidemic to a pandemic. Now, with naming the virus, um, just so you know, for the outbreak of a new viral disease, three names have to be decided. Uh, the name of the disease, the virus, and the species. In this particular case, the WHO is responsible for the name of the disease. Uh, the expert virologists uh, are responsible for the virus name, and the, uh, the committee uh, is uh, responsible for the species name. Uh, that is the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. 
So uh, the disease name was designated as COVID-19 by the WHO in February uh, of this year. Uh, the virus name, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, was named by the virologist. And the species to which it belongs uh, was the SARS, uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that is. Uh, the species is, is the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome-related coronavirus. Yeah, with the pathophysiology, um, uh, Again, a lot of things were were discovered, and um, this is actually these are some of the things that actually came about uh, from that time in February until now. Um, it was determined that the virus itself, uh, the life cycle, consists of basically four phases. You have the attachment phase, penetration phase, the biosynthesis with assembly, and again, and then it being released back into circulation. And this slide right here is, uh, actually depicts the true life cycle of the virus itself. So the uh, the virus it's composed of single stranded RNA um, uh, genetic material that is actually within a nuclear capsid layer, surrounded by a membrane, and with surface proteins present. These surface proteins are spikes. Now the virus uh, targets uh, uh, cells. Uh, with the ACE2 receptors. And uh, these cells are actually present in the nasal epithelium, uh, and they're also in the respiratory tract. Uh, in addition, there are ACE2 receptors uh, present on the heart, uh, in the ileum of the small intestine, and the uh, kidneys. And the virus itself, um, in the lungs where it gains entry, targets uh, the type 1 and the type 2 cells in the lungs. The type 1 cells are the structural cells, and type 2 are the surfactant producing cells. Now, the spike protein binds with the ACE2 receptor, and on the surface, uh, you have uh, what's known as the uh, uh, transmembrane serine protease. It's on the host surfaces. Uh, there, it um, what it does, it sort of cleaves the head of the spike protein, and that material within the spike protein binds with the host cell membrane. And this helps facilitate the entry of the cell, uh, I'm sorry, of the virus into the host cell. And uh, this is also accomplished by endocytosis. Now, once inside the cell, the virus uh, becomes uncoated and its genetic material, which is the RNA, uh, gets released into the cytoplasm. And from there, it does attach to the host cell ribosome. Now, at the ribosomes, this RNA gets translated. The first protein that actually gets uh, made is a uh, protein called an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Now, this RNA polymerase um, does uh, read and produce more RNA uh, that will be the genetic material for future viruses. In addition, uh, there are codes for other proteins that make up the uh, entire virus. Uh, there are spike proteins, along with envelope membrane proteins and nuclear capsid proteins. Now, these um, all get assembled. They make their way to the endoplasmic reticulum. And from there, uh, they then make their way to the Golgi apparatus, where they're sort of packaged and handled. Um, it eventually becomes combined with the other viral RNA uh, and it gets packaged into uh, a new virion. And this new virion matures, and then it makes its way toward the cell surface, whereby through exocytosis, it gets released into the circulation to go infect more cells. Now, while this process is taking place, uh, it does cause damage to the cell, and this damage initiates the inflammatory response. And these, in this inflammatory response, cytokines and other inflammatory molecules get released by, uh, by infected uh, type 1 and type 2 cells that were initially invaded. In addition, there in the alveoli, uh, you have type 3 cells, which are, which are actually alveolar macrophages. And they get activated and revved up as well. 
uh, again, it releases uh, different cytokines that signal for other inflammatory cells, such as T cells, monocytes, neutrophils, and more macrophages, uh, they get recruited to the area, and then even more cytokines are released. Cytokines such as TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and interleukin-10. Uh, these all get released. Now, this inflammatory response unfortunately becomes dysregulated and to the point where it actually causes destruction to normal intact uh, lung tissue. By doing so, it does increase vascular permeability. And um, what happens is the uh, alveolar spaces fill up with albumin, which drags along more fluid. Um, and over time, we get hyaline membranes, uh, 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 hyaline membranes form. And as a result of, of those things and the destruction that takes place, uh, we get changes in the lungs that are compatible with uh, what appears to be adult respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. In addition, there's activation of coagulation uh, that leads to microthrombi being formed, which also leads to a pulmonary thrombosis and then possible embolisms causing uh, PEs, uh, pulmonary embolus, deep venous thrombosis, but also uh, can cause uh, strokes, uh, ischemic strokes leading, uh, or should I say as a result, of these uh, of these thrombi that are being projected. So this whole dysregulated inflammatory response is referred to as the cytokine storm. Now the changes that have occurred as a result of this uh, lead to some of the symptoms that patients will have, such as cough, dyspnea, and fever. And these are some of the hallmark symptoms of COVID-19 infection. Now, because you have ACE2 receptors uh, that are expressed also not only in the brain, but the heart, uh, the uh, ileum, and the kidney, you can also see injury in other areas, including the liver. Uh, they may have elevated uh, transaminases along with bilirubin. Cardiac injury can also occur uh, as evidenced by uh, uh, elevated troponins, dysrhythmias, resulting in myocarditis and congestive heart failure. With regards to the kidney, acute kidney injury uh, can occur. And again, with the brain being involved, neurologic complications such as altered mental status can also occur. So this is just a um, another quick view of uh, the actual invasion of host cell by the virus. And um, again, there's a spike protein, uh, the activated transmembrane serine protease, which again, as I mentioned, uh, helps facilitate entry of the virus into the cell. And then once in, again, as I mentioned before, uh, the uh, RNA, the genetic material gets released. And through that series that I mentioned, um, we get new virions uh, formed and then released into circulation. Now, uh, again, speaking about the dysregulated uh, response, again, this is uh, the immune response itself, uh, just a uh, depiction of that with the inflammatory cells coming in, the other inflammatory cells releasing their cytokines. Um, and uh, also, again, getting activation of the uh, coagulation system as well. And then uh, uh, late phase, uh, as I mentioned before, there's the pulmonary edema into the, into the lung and interstitium. Uh, you get the hyaline membrane formation. Uh, and then um, one thing I didn't mention was uh, we do get activation of the kinin uh, calcin system. And that further contributes to vascular leakage, uh, leading to more edema being present. Now, with regards to epidemiology, over 50 million cases have been confirmed worldwide of uh, COVID-19. And it's been reported all over the world, uh, according to what the World Health Organization indicates. Cases have been reported on every continent with the exception of Antarctica. 
And that actually remains true today. Now, the um, reservoir for the SARS-CoV-2 has been determined to be bats. And it's believed that the virus has jumped uh, the species barrier uh, to humans. Uh, they believe the intermediate host for that has been the pangolins. The intermediate host, you know, could be a domestic food animal, a wild animal, or a domesticated wild animal. But again, we at this point, the, the, the current belief is that it's the uh, pangolin. And this is just a depiction um, with regards to the uh, previous coronaviruses. Uh, again, the bat is the reservoir. Uh, the intermediate animal, of course, with MERS was the camel, and with the original SARS, it was believed to be the uh, civet cat. Okay, with regards to transmission, uh, now transmission occurs primarily through respiratory droplets from face-to-face -face contact, and those droplets uh, become inhaled. Now, the droplets are expelled during face-to-face -face exposure, during talking, coughing, sneezing, and even singing. Now, the model uh, through, um, through studies that have been done most recently indicate that um, we have different sized droplets being present. Larger droplets, which are believed to be greater than five microns, uh, tend to fall to the ground once they're expelled. There are smaller droplets that appear to be within a turbulent gas cloud that aren't really, they're, they're expelled, but they don't fall immediately. They stay within that cloud and can travel, uh, can travel a, a number of feet. Uh, and most recent data indicates that it can travel even beyond, well beyond six feet. And some reports say as far as maybe 20 or 30 feet when projected. So as I indicated, the larger droplets tend to fall quickly, but the aerosols, those things that are traveling on that uh, turbulent gas cloud, um, uh, can potentially uh, be present for hours, potentially. And so thus aerosol, aerosolized viruses are much more likely to be infectious than viruses bound to the larger respiratory droplets, which fall to the ground there. Um, uh, however, it is noted that to date, no study has really demonstrated actual clinical evidence of airborne, uh, uh, that is aerosols on the air currents uh, with regards to transmission of SARS-CoV-2, uh, unlike uh, something like measles or tuberculosis. Uh, no study has really demonstrated that. Right now, the overwhelming majority of transmission is through these large respiratory droplets. And the data conclusively in, has indicated that uh, this is the case. And they've actually demonstrated this through contact tracing, through other studies, and through cluster uh, investigation. Now, according to the CDC, and here's another statement with, uh, uh, to that point, Available data indicate that the SARS-CoV-2 has spread more like other common respiratory viruses, again, primarily through large respiratory droplets within a short range, around six feet. And again, to date, there's no evidence of more efficient spread to people far away uh, or those that enter a space after an infectious person might have been there. Now, transmission can also occur, but to a lesser degree, at touching a contaminated surface. Uh, and as this is done through fomites. And touching the contaminated surfaces and then touching the mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, and mouth uh, is another way of transmission. Now, with clinical presentation, the symptoms uh, for uh, COVID-19 usually appear anywhere from two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. And some of the presenting symptoms are fevers and chills, cough, 
shortness of breath, general fatigue, muscle or body aches, headaches, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Now, uh, this is a, a graph indicating the uh, percentage of people with those particular symptoms. And as you can tell, the combination of fever, cough, and shortness of breath, uh, the vast majority of people are going to present with those symptoms. Uh, after that, uh, people would cough, over 50% were present with, the, with that. Uh, and with regards to the other symptoms, they're broken down. Uh, I think fever would be next, followed by uh, the uh, presence of uh, myalgias. And uh, again, all these are flu type symptoms, but these are just the percentages that will, uh, the patients with COVID 19. Now, what about testing? Well, there are three tests, three main tests that are used. Uh, the first two are the ones that are primarily used. The first is the RT PCR test. It's uh, the uh, molecular diagnostic test. It's considered the, uh, the gold standard. It has a uh, very high sensitivity, uh, up anywhere between 95 to 99%. And again, it is the, uh, the gold standard and uses the clinical diagnostic test of choice. The other test uh, is an antigen test. Um, this test uh, uses immunoassays to detect a specific antigen that indicates or would be present for an active infection. Now, um, the sensitivity of this is less than that of the PCR, but it's still relatively high, so around 90%. Um, the test really performs best when the person is tested in the early stages of infection, and that's usually when the viral load is the, generally the highest. Uh, the advantage of the antigen test, one of the advantages, is that it does have a very rapid turnaround time, uh, as opposed to the uh, RT-PCR test. The uh, third test, the antibody test, uh, it's a serologic test. And it tends to look for antibodies in the blood, but it can tell if you had the virus in the past. Uh, it is not really... Uh, advantageous to use this test for an acute infection. And also, it really does not discriminate between the COVID-19 coronavirus and other previous coronaviruses, including human coronavirus. Now, um, if you have a, a patient that does test positive, uh, we generally recommend telling these people to stay at home unless they're seeking medical care. Uh, separate themselves. If they are positive, they are, uh, and they isolate themselves, they're considered, uh, again, isolation. Uh, if they're not positive, or let's say they're maybe part of a contact tracing group, um, and uh, cases like that where they have not tested positive, they are considered under quarantine. But nevertheless, they're told to monitor the symptoms and they're advised to follow Care instructions from their health care provider and also their local health department. Now, when should a person seek medical attention? Okay, uh, CDC has, has specified these are some of the things that they can look for um, when seeking uh, or that would have them seek med emergency medical attention. Uh, if they have trouble breathing, persistent pressure or pain in the chest, any new confusion, they have inability to uh, awaken or stay awake, or if they begin to note bluish lips or uh, areas on the face. Now, of course, these are not all the possible symptoms, but uh, the key is that you're having a worsening, a change which is a worsening of whatever symptoms they have been having. And, it, and at that point, they are recommended to uh, call 911 or they can call the head to their facility. Uh, to let them know that they're coming in for evaluation. So, in the assessment of patients uh, that are hospitalized, 
um, we, we recommend evaluating for features associated with severe illness. Also, we'd like to identify any organ dysfunction or other comorbidities, and also take note of any current medications that could complicate potential therapy. We also recommend checking a lab test to uh, evaluate these patients with either documented or suspected COVID-19 infection. Uh, however, um, uh, it is noted that the prognostic value of some of these tests uh, still remains somewhat uncertain. Yeah, so again, in the assessment, uh, here's a partial list of some of the underlying medical conditions that can portend a poor prognosis in someone who uh, has COVID-19. Uh, conditions such as cancer, chronic kidney disease, COPD, any kind of heart condition, any immunocompromised state, obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes, a history of smoking, and most recently, um, pregnancy and sickle cell disease were added uh, from the CDC. Now, some of the laboratory tests that are that are used and monitored um, initially, uh, CBC with differential, with the focus on the total leukocyte count trend. Uh, these patients do tend to present with lipopenia, and so um, it's recommended, you know, to check their total lymphocyte count. In addition, noting the complete metabolic panel. Their uh, CK levels, creatinine kinase, uh, along with CRP levels and ferritin. Those last two are more acute phase reactants, and uh, noting their trends uh, can help you uh, ascertain how they're doing clinically. Now, uh, uh, other things that you do want to check at baseline, and if it seems as though they're, they're uh, clinically worsening, you can repeat uh, the LDH. Also, troponins, especially if they're complaining of uh, chest pain or discomfort. And uh, it's also recommended to get an EKG with at least one. Um, again, if their symptoms are worsening, uh, especially cardiac symptoms, then you definitely want to repeat that, um, see if there's any type of uh, cardiac issues uh, going, uh, that, that, that are occurring. Uh, in addition, any some well some medications do require monitoring uh, the uh, 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 the QT interval, and so QT prolongation uh, with some medications uh, can occur. Yeah, as far as imaging goes, um, with imaging, portable chest X-rays are what are primarily recommended. Computerized tomography or CT scans of chest um, indicate circumstances that it, it's it, well. We actually we actually recommend only performing those when there's a change in in, in circumstances or uh, there's a change in clinical management. The uh, reason for that primarily is to minimize uh, infection uh, infection spreading uh, among the personnel. Uh, related to transport or even exposure. But, um, and I just wanted to take a second to point out that these are actually the types of images that you would see um, when we were talking about the dysregulated response, pulmonary edema, hyaluronic membrane formation, and the development of ARDS. Uh, these are the types of images that are consistent, uh, consistent with that. Now, one important uh, thing I do want to emphasize is that secondary bacterial infection really has not been frequently reported as a feature of COVID-19. Now, patients with uh, documented COVID-19, uh, empiric therapy for bacterial pneumonia is not routinely administered. Now, the data is limited. But so far, bacterial superinfection doesn't, to be, doesn't appear to be a prominent feature. However, if you have clinical features that are difficult to distinguish between bacterial pneumonia, such as uh, development of a new fever after, uh, after they've defervesced, 
or the presence of new consolidation on imaging, then the empiric treatment for community-acquired pneumonia is reasonable. And at this point, because the diagnosis is uncertain. Now, uh, it's recommended that you try to make the diagnosis of pneumonia as quickly as possible. Um, you can get sputum gram stains, do your, uh, your, your urinary cultures, your, I'm sorry, urinary antigen testing, and your uh, uh, sputum cultures. And again, if it, if it does turn out that they don't have them, or they're not acutely infected uh, from a bacterial to from an antibiotic stewardship standpoint, stop the uh, unnecessary antibiotic. In addition, um, for patients who need bronchodilator therapy, it's recommended that meat dose inhalers are used as opposed to the uh, um, uh, because we all have done over the years, we've given those to uh, the nebulization of the bronchodilators. Unfortunately, this can, uh, this can create aerosols. So again, if bronchodilators are needed, try using a meter dose inhaler. Now, overall, um, uh, most most patients um, uh, looking at the percentages of how they do, and this is overall of everyone involved. Eighty percent of patients who actually develop COVID-19 will have mild disease. Fifteen percent, however, will have severe disease. And 5% of those uh, of, of people will have life threatening. And these are primarily people with high, older patients with higher comorbidity. Now, what about treatments? On October 22nd, remdesivir was actually, I think that's just the first treatment um, approved for COVID 19 disease. The approval for the use of remdesivir was based on clinical trials. There was the ACT trial and a couple of the simple trials, simple severe and the simple moderate trial. The ACT-1 trial did show the hospitalized patients with COVID-19 who, who did receive remdesivir had a shorter median recovery time than those who received placebo. Uh, and most recently they say that, initially they said 11 days to 15 days, but most recently, uh, they now say 10 days versus 15 days uh, for recovery. The other two trials also used for the approval of remdesivir simple trials. They were open label phase three trials conducted in countries that had a higher uh, prevalence of COVID-19. The simple severe trial uh, was a randomized uh, multicenter trial that evaluated the uh, efficacy and safety of five and 10 day dosing of remdesivir. Uh, and they used, also they had standard of care that was used. And uh, they said about 397 patients, adult patients. And the endpoint, again, was the clinical status on day 14. The uh, simple moderate trial um, also used randomized uh, controlled multicenter study. Uh, again, five and 10 day dosing uh, of remdesivir plus standard of care. Um, this, um, uh, well, versus standard of care alone. And uh, these hospitals, uh, which were numbered about, uh, well, they had about 600 patients uh, and they had moderate uh, COVID-19. So based on those, the recommendations for pharmacologic management of, the, of patients with COVID-19 are as follows. Yeah, these are guidelines taken from the National Institute of Health, the NIH, uh, treatment guidelines. They have they had a panel uh, that came up with the guidelines. And uh, here at the University of Louisville, uh, this is what our infectious disease uh, department, department uh, advocates. So uh, if we look first um, uh, at patients who are not hospital hospitalized, or if they are hospitalized, uh, but don't require supplemental oxygen. Um, the panel recommends against the use of dexamethasone. Uh, and actually the panel did recommend initially against the use of remdesivir uh, before, uh, before it was um, uh, authorized. But uh, these patients who don't require supplemental oxygen, uh, we don't recommend uh, those treatments. 
Now, when you have hospitalized patients that do require supplemental oxygen, and again, we're talking low flow oxygen, not high flow oxygen, not non-invasive or not the use of uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation or mechanical ventilation or, or ECMO, then remdesivir is recommended. The dose is uh, 200 milligrams on the first day, followed by four days of 100 milligram IV dosing or until hospital discharge, whichever comes first. Now, uh, an alternative um, uh, treatment for that is still remdesivir with the same dosing, but also adding dexamethasone, six milligrams, either IV or PO, for up to 10 days or hospital discharge, whichever comes first. Uh, at one time, remdesivir was uh, in very short supply. And because of that, dexamethasone uh, can be substituted. If that's still the case, uh, you, and, and you still do not have remdesivir available, you can still give dexamethasone. Now, for hospitalized patients that do require high flow oxygen or non-invasive ventilation, but not mechanical ventilation or ECMO, uh, dexamethasone and remdesivir at those previously mentioned doses are recommended. And again, if there's still short supply or remdesivir is not available, uh, dexamethasone can still be given. And then finally, for the patients who are mechanically ventilated, or on ECMO, uh, dexamethasone is recommended. And most people will give dexamethasone plus remdesivir if it's available uh, for those patients, uh, and especially those who have been recently intubated, again, with the same parameters. Now, there's one small caveat. Uh, uh, after, after, five, after five days, if the patient is not substantially better, you can continue to dose of remdesivir in additional five days or a total of 10 days. Now, uh, one of the newer things on the front, on November 9th, the FDA did grant Eli Lilly an emergency use authorization for the monoclonal antibody, uh, Benlivunab. Um, it was noted that this uh, monoclonal antibody would keep COVID-19 patients from progressing to the point where they need to be hospitalized. So the emergency use authorization does not apply, however, to patients who are in the hospital or who need help breathing. In those cases, it's been noted that uh, this monoclonal antibody, uh, if given to patients, the patients will likely do worse. And especially if they're hospitalized and in need of high flow oxygen or mechanical ventilation. Research did suggest that this drug was no better than placebo uh, in helping patients clear the virus. However, it did reduce the likelihood that patients would later need to be hospitalized. Now, bamlanivimab is given through IV in a single dose, and uh, it is for adults and children over age 12 with mild to moderate symptoms. Um, and those being uh, the patients who do not have shortness of breath or abnormal chest imaging, uh, and those who have saturations greater than 94%. Um, and uh, these are primarily patients who have high risk of becoming worse and needing hospitalization. This is the, uh, this is the major indication for this monoclonal antibody. Now, other therapies that were used initially, such as the chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, with or without azithromycin, uh, lapanavir, ritonavir, and other protease inhibitors, along with ivermectin. In the panel, the NIH panel that came up with the guidelines, they actually recommend against using uh, these, um, these uh, uh, therapies. Um, they said they really don't recommend using unless you're in a clinical trial. So otherwise, they don't, again, recommend its use. And also, they said there's insufficient data as far as using things like convalescent plasma, uh, uh, certain uh, SARS-2 immunoglobulins, mesocomal stem cells, or even IVIG. Uh, the panel lead goes as far as to recommend against the use of these products, except in a clinical trial. 
Now, uh, in the last remaining few minutes, we'll talk very quickly about vaccines. Uh, just in general, uh, just real quick background. With vaccines, most of the traditional vaccines have been egg-based, and they're used for live, attenu live attenuated uh, uh, vaccines and also for killed vaccines. Um, they've been used um, uh, or, uh, and actually constructed this particular way for over 70 years. And the premise behind that is once the immune system, or once these are getting injected in the body, the immune system mounts an antibody response, and then the virus is ultimately destroyed. Now, the advantages of the traditional way of making these vaccines, they, have, they do have proven efficacy, they do have an established safety profile, and they are well understood in the manufacturing process. Some of the disadvantages, however, of this process is it takes months and months uh, for them to be to to be made. Uh, also, massive amount massive amounts of eggs are needed for the process, and the process itself is complicated. Now, um, one of the newer processes uh, that some of the companies are uh, are using uh, to make vaccines. Uh, are the use of uh, messenger RNA. Now, the, uh, the way these work are the, uh, the genetic sequence of the virus, uh, uh, particularly in, for the coronavirus in this case, uh, the, the messaging sequence of the um, spike proteins are identified. Uh, once identified, they're encoded on uh, a messenger RNA that's manufactured. And what happens is this messenger RNA is administered to patients where it's taken up by their cells. Now, just like with the COVID-19 uh, COVID infection, once it gets taken up by the cells, it makes its way to the ribosomes. And then translation of those proteins, and in this particular case, the spike proteins, are created. Now, uh, once you have the spike proteins there, they are recognized as being foreign or antigenic substances, and the immune response begins, and ultimately antibodies are created, and they help destroy, um, in this case, the spike proteins. And at that point, memory cells, when needed, can regenerate antibody. So if a person comes in contact with the coronavirus, the spike proteins on the coronavirus, then the memory cells will generate antibody. Again, this is the premise behind the RNA vaccine. So roughly now, there's about 213 vaccines that are currently in development, uh, but the leading candidates uh, were identified. Um, they had Operation Warp Speed uh, that was a government task force formed to, uh, to increase or expedite the production of vaccines for COVID-19. And these are some of the leading candidates. Uh, the first is the University of Oxford uh, vaccine uh, that was made in partnership with AstraZeneca, uh, AstraZeneca excuse me. And um, um, what, it, what it does is it, it actually um, develops uh, uh, what appears to be spike proteins on an adenovirus. Um, once again, it gets injected, uh, the body responds, and then antibodies are, are made. The virus itself is modified, so it doesn't replicate and uh, it doesn't make uh, it doesn't actually injure the person. Uh, the second virus, and this is uh, one of the uh, messenger RNA viruses, is Moderna. I'm sure uh, most people heard about this in the news lately. Again, uh, it does use um, the uh, 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 encoding of the RNA to make spike proteins once it's ingested in, in, injected in the body and taken up by the cell. Uh, the spike proteins are manufactured uh, and then antibodies are made against it. Um, the uh, thing about the Moderma is it's a two-shot vaccine and the two shots are given 28 days apart. Pfizer also has a uh, messenger RNA vaccine and uh, the Pfizer vaccine works the exact same way uh, as Moderna and the other RNA uh, vaccines. Uh, the thing about the Moderna, it's two shots, but they are 21 days apart. 
a major lo logistical point that's still being worked out is that the the uh, I'm sorry the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored uh, in in some type of storage container that has to be maintained at 70, 70 degrees uh, below zero centigrade. And finally, uh, Johnson & Johnson has, the, has a uh, vaccine. Uh, it, like the uh, Oxford vaccine, uses an adenovirus. Uh, it too is actually still in phase three trial. Uh, the advantage of, of this particular virus is that it's only one, one shot, one dose instead of two. Again, quickly, just uh, for interest's sake, uh, I believe most people heard over the summer, Russia had announced that they had a vaccine that they were going to use. Um, it was um, this um, particular vaccine that had been renamed the Sputnik V. However, uh, because of the outcry, the fact that they did not go through phase three, um, uh, that actual vaccine was held and actually is going through phase three now. Um, and uh, that's uh, so far, you know, they're saying out of Russia that uh, the new vaccine is yielding antibodies and they do have mild side effects. So in closing, uh, until we have worldwide distribution of an effective and safe vaccine, just want to mention that we still have to do what everyone has been preaching uh, since uh, the beginning of this and still want to encourage uh, wearing a mask that covers your nose, mouth, and chin, keeping a safe physical distance at least six feet, making sure um, uh, people wash their hands, stay away from big crowds with poorly ventilated areas, and if a person coughs, they cover their mouth and nose when coughing. So, uh, and lastly, to stay up to date, uh, the guidelines that I had mentioned before, the treatment guidelines uh, for the NIH, they are online. Um, and also, um, there are a couple of real-time uh, 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 sites that uh, actually have dashboards that, again, track in real-time the coronavirus. Uh, one is the uh, from WHO, and the other from John Hopkins uh, uh, is interactive. And uh, I believe I'm going to stop here um, and take any questions anyone may. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Burns. Uh, the key question, it seems to me now, is whether we can identify the people who are at highest risk of serious complications from COVID. And with that in mind, I was wondering whether you saw the most recent data published in Nature about the interferon pathway differences between individuals who get severe disease and those that don't, and whether you think that would become potentially a screening um, uh, test for patients who might be more severely affected. I put the link in the text of the talk this morning for you to take a look at if you were not familiar with that. Okay, all right, I sure will. No, I, I'm not I'm not intimately familiar with it, uh, but I think it has a lot of potential and a lot of great information. The thing, again, about COVID-19, um, it is uh, has a lot of moving parts. And we learn something about it every day. So uh, even this quote unquote most up to date information I gave, you know, some of that is even obsolete now compared to what transpires from day to day. Dr. Burns had a question in the, another question in the uh, in the chat area, asking if you could share share current knowledge on the health disparities of COVID morbidity and mortality. Well, yeah, the uh, actual, dis there, there are, and there are uh, a lot of disparities, um, both um, actually uh, age-wise and, uh, and uh, race-wise. It's been shown a disproportionate number of, um, of hospitalizations and deaths. They do occur in lower income and minority population. Um, and uh, it's, it's really difficult to say the disproportionate is is an actual burden uh, uh, on our system. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you have disparities in housing and transportation and overall health. Unfortunately, in minority populations, it's been shown they're likely to live in densely populated areas. Uh, they depend on public transportation, and then they also work in jobs um, where a lot of times, um, unfortunately, uh, working from home uh, would not be an option. 
And so those individuals uh, are, going, are actually shown to have a higher prevalence um, of, of developing disease uh, and also uh, because of the higher prevalence of chronic health conditions uh, that, are, that are present. So yeah, those are, those are some of the disparities that, that unfortunately um, uh, we have in our system. If anyone else has questions, you can unmute your microphone and, and go ahead and ask it. And uh, just real quick, Dr. Burns, uh, one more question from the uh, from the chat area. Um, some um, they may have gone in just a little late, but they are wondering if you covered any mortality benefit with bavolinumab, and if there's any data on that. Uh, no, actually, um, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't have any. I don't have any data on hand um, because um, uh, it it was actually just approved about what three days ago. Um, I haven't actually had an opportunity to do more research on it. Uh, again, I know it, it, like Regeneron, which was the monoclonal antibody uh, President Trump uh, received, um, uh, it's, 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 it's new, it, it's still experimental, um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a, I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of published information. On it. Okay, and one more, another question. Uh, does the sensitivity of the PCR diagnostic test vary with the course of the COVID-19 infection? Um, I, I haven't seen exact data, but looking at it intuitively, um, you know, the, the actual course itself, um, initially when a person is, is, who, who is infected, if they're asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, uh, that's when they tend to have the highest viral load. Now, uh, the virus is cleared at different rates in different people. And unfortunately, even after a person has recovered from their symptoms, uh, they can still shed virus. The question is, um, uh, how virulent uh, is the virus that's, that's being shed? And it's been shown that over time, um, because these machines are so sensitive, you know, they actually pick up what is interpreted as being virus, but again, they may not be uh, as viable as uh, the viruses that were uh, shed or produced at the beginning uh, of the infection. All right, another question from, uh, actually kind of a, it'll be a comment and leading to a question. Mm -hmm. um, the thought of injecting foreign genetic material into potentially a wide range of human cells throughout the body troubles me. From this particular, from this, the person asking this question, it seems possible that some cell damage or exocytosis will occur with the generation of antibodies to other than the virus. Uh, won't it take years to tell what the potential long-term safety will be, and is this not a form of gene therapy? Uh, well, um, that and that's actually been the challenge uh, for these companies that that have that have come up with with these methods. Just so you know. Um, they have actually uh, the, the actual use of um, of like like RNA to manufacture viruses um, or, or manufacture portions of the virus to generate an antigenic response. The concept is not really that new. They've done it in animals before, but they've never done it in humans. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions as far as that goes. Um, uh, it's one of those things where. You know, we uh, let's say under normal circumstances, that is minus COVID. You know, yeah, absolutely. I I, I have no doubt that that it, that they would have gone with years and years of of study. You know, to actually see uh, those poten potential those things that could potentially occur. However, because we're in the pandemic and because of such a high death rate uh, and the emphasis uh, on coming up with a vaccine as soon as possible, but that is safe and effective, um, I, I believe that's been the main driver behind this. So I believe that's the reason this has been rushed the way it has. Uh, but but I but I do agree. It's it's I wouldn't necessarily say it's troubling, but it's it's definitely concerning enough where in the ideal situation you would want to see over time how this how this develops. Uh, but yeah, we're sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, taking a leap of faith, you know, going this route and using these things and pushing the vaccines out, you know, probably quicker than, than they should be. 
All right, I got a few a few more questions from the chat area. The first one is, um, and obviously I'm a lay person, so you'll have to maybe figure out my translation. Is is NFKB the initial trigger of the cytokine response, and has anyone oops and has anyone treated with monoclonal blocker? Um, I haven't, of course. I mean, I obviously haven't seen all the literature. Um, I haven't, uh, I, I haven't, I haven't seen where where it's an exact trigger. Um, uh, but at the same time, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a virologist, uh, and uh, I really can't speak to these to the actual intricacies of this. I, I sort of when I presented this, I just presented sort of like a like a. a General overview of it, um, uh, but uh, I have I haven't really searched searched the literature from a virology standpoint, you know, to tell all the exact mechanisms. So uh, I really couldn't answer that question. Um, uh, I would just refer refer to the uh, just just to the literature for that. I personally have not seen it. Okay, another question. Um... Scroll down a little bit, give me one. Oh, okay, the prevalence world charts lead to an obvious question. Why the lowest rates in Africa? Is this due to lack of testing or something else? Yeah, that, and, and again, another great question. Um, it's, it's honestly hard to say because also if you look at Canada, their rates, I mean, if you just go across the border, uh, it's almost like they hardly have any at all, okay? Is that due to uh, maybe maybe measures that were taken early in the, in the disease uh, or in the pandemic, you know, to to stem spread? Hard to say. Uh, in some other countries, pretty much the same thing. Uh, I do know that we that we test that we are testing much more than we ever had before, uh, which I think is is essential um, uh, when you talk about uh, uh, battling COVID nineteen. Um, but I'm not sure of all the parameters of why they use. But I, I would suspect that, uh, given their given the economic status throughout the country, I don't think testing is as widespread there as it is uh, here in the U.S. All right, and one more question, and real before I ask it, uh, uh, Jessica Petrie from the Kornhauser Library has posted some really helpful links in the chat area regard in relation to some of the things you talked about. So if anybody wants to check out the chat area there's a couple of really some good links and I'll I'll copy those as well if anybody um, wants can he wants to email me and I can I can send those to them uh, the next question is what do you tell patients who have the who have had COVID and want to know whether they are immune from getting it again specifically I've heard that public health departments some in some places are telling folks that they are considered immune for three months do you agree this seems to be a premature assumption well, uh, the, the, right. the question is, the question is, do you agree? And then it continues. Right. The, yeah, the, uh, yeah, it's well, right now. Again, everything, you know, this is all early, but according to the literature and, and when you talk about uh, reinfection, I mean, in the U.S., there's only been one documented case. And that was in Nevada. Worldwide, I think there may have been another case, I believe, in Japan. So it would appear, at least right now, that um, reinfection uh, uh, is not not that much of an issue, uh, but but we really can't say because because we really don't know. We really don't know. Um, we don't know if the antibodies, the person who has had COVID, uh, you know, if they would even work because uh, there's actually been recent reports that the virus is starting to mutate. So uh, it and and chances are if you have antibodies, it, it's almost almost I, I look at it like I look at it similar to the flu in that respect. In that uh, once it once it mutates, I, I, I don't think those antibodies are, are are effective against this new mutation that that, that would occur. But now you know it, had, it, it supposedly has not been documented yet. But again. Uh, to my knowledge, there's only been, I believe, two cases worldwide, one here in the U.S. and one in Japan, where a person has become infected again with COVID-19. And okay. it's, it's, it's hard to say. It, and right now, there's no guarantee that the antibodies are going to protect them. Definitely not you know, beyond, beyond, beyond 90 days. We, we just don't know. 
we don't have the information. We don't know. All right. And so far, if anyone has any more questions, if you want to type it in the chat area real quick, or if you, you can unmute your mic and ask Dr. Burns directly, uh, we got a time for maybe one or two more if anybody has anything real quick. I know we're, we, we're, we, yeah, anybody has, has anything real quick. Thank you, Thanks. Mark. Yeah, that was a fantastic, uh, super well presented. Thank you for uh, the care and the pathophysiology and the symptoms, and we need we need that. And also your up, your very uh, good update on on treatments and and uh, the vaccines, Mark. That was fantastic. We really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Burns. Thank you, Dr. Arnold, and Dr. Kruger, and. Uh, We'll be back next week with Dr. Gavgazi from uh, cardiology. But Dr. Burns, again, from echoing the, everyone, thank you so much. This, is, this was great. Thank you.